Jeff Hawkins wanted to study the brain. Just ask him. We're working on machine intelligence and we study the brain. We also need to feed his family. Grid Systems was way ahead of its time. Grid was a computer manufacturer credited with making the first modern laptop. Hawkins had developed a stylus-based pen computer at Grid. According to legend, Hawkins was unhappy because Grid did not give him the leverage he wanted to continue to develop this new type of device. But Grid sold to Tandy and under the leadership of CEO John Roach. Roach is credited with having the vision for both the TRS-80 and the Tandy 1000 and he knew personal devices would be the next big thing. Not being technical, he reached out to the best partner Radio Shack had for these kinds of things, Casio. Uh, it was a personal uh, digital assistant. It uh, read, uh, read uh, handwriting and what have you. We had some handwriting expertise. And so uh, I went to the Orient and I got Mr. Casio and talked him into building us a personal digital assistant. Roach flew to Japan, met with Casio, and about a year later, the Zoomer was launched. Jeff Hawkins designed the software for the Zoomer in 1993, just two months after the message pad 100, and just in time for the Christmas season. As was his usual practice to help reduce R&D initial marketing costs, he licensed the software back to Casio, who made the Zoomer Z7000, with the Tandy being the Zoomer ZPDA. The Zoomer was a failure in the market. According to Roach, it's underpowered and overpriced. Compared to Newton or Casio, however, it was a certified success. The fact of the matter was, there were actually many computers with hard drives running DOS that cost just 100 more than the base cost of Zoomer. Looking at the original Tandy Zoomer, you can see it looks like a small Newton clone, where the Casio looks more like his Palm Pilot offspring. Now, in the old boys' corporate world, it is commonplace to allow the designer of a product or lead of that product to be given the opportunity to take the product and develop it in the market himself once the parent company abandons the idea. So Roach told Hawkins, the Zoomer, with some seed money, he hired six engineers and a marketing person, and he started Palm, just a year after the Zoomer was released. In a recent interview with Roach, he sees that this is one of his biggest regrets. He didn't think about making the Zoomer a phone or connected computing device, but had he, Radio Shack would have had the smartphone a full 15 years before the iPhone was released. But Roach at the end of his career anyway, and Radio Shack was hemorrhaging money from losses on the computer division. He was just given enough rope to hang himself from the Zoomer, which he promptly did. So Jeff Hawkins essentially was gifted to Zoomer, just as Bill Bailey, the founder of iOmega, was gifted the Bernoulli drive from IBM, which eventually became the Zip drive. The Palm Pilot was essentially the Zoomer too, with more memory and processing power. Palm Computing started out making software to support the Zoomer. Since a lot of the R&D had already been paid for, the pilot was a huge moneymaker, but Palm also developed software to support its only competitor, the Apple Newton. Still, it took the fledgling company nearly five years to release a sequel to the original. Just like the Zoomer, the personal model was underpowered and overpriced at $300, but for another $100, you'd get the Pro model, which was just good enough for most users. By now, Palm had perfected its handwriting recognition called Graffiti, partially through code improvement, and partially through defeaturing the product to only recognize a single letter at a time. Palm was a smash hit. In fact, maybe too good. Wall Street was clamoring for a success story as the dot-com bubble was rapidly approaching. U.S. Robotics had already bought the company, but it really was a merger, and a good one. Palm needed help in the data transfer and connectivity areas, and ended up being a big help. But they still had a target on their back, and just three months after the successful launch of the original pilot, 3Com bought the company. While U.S. Robotics had been good partners, the impression was that 3Com were basically corporate marauders and caused the exodus of Palm for all of its founding talent. The new company, Handspring, really had no competition. They knew, that Palm had, had, they knew what Palm had coming, and they were underfunded. This was all happening in mid-1998, just as the world was collapsing around them, but they still managed to make both the Visor and the Trio and were quite successful. They also had a much improved industrial design, and it just looked cool. In 1999, 3Com bought Handspring and then spun the division off to, to be the new Palm as a separately publicly traded company. Uh, it, with double the market value of the company that had just purchased it uh, in the 90s. 
Inside, they were similar to the original, but used the latest available ARM processors from Motorola. We were only too happy to sell them at bargain rates. Quickly, they moved from 15 megahertz to half a megagram to the legendary Motorola MC68BZ328. This gave them all the processing power they needed and then some. By 2002, Trio smartphones began to arrive. Palm at that point lost their way a little. Windows Mobile was, well, let's face it, a steaming hot pile of coding. And of course, Palm was very happy with the ARM CPU, but Windows Mobile was slow and didn't allocate video resources to allow it for full touch screen use. All trios had a full keyboard and started going head to head with Blackberry, who already established a market. 3Com had learned its lesson and bought, hands, and, and bought Handspring to form Palm again, this time with a hands-off approach. Now the same, now the name of the game was cellular integration, later to be known as a smartphone. The original trio was basically a Palm Pilot with a more rugged, rugged case and the CDMA phone built in. Basically it used a modem emulation for email, but that was about it. You still had to sync with your PC using a cable. The much more expensive but infinitely more usable BlackBerry was really bordering on being a smartphone already. With BlackBerry, your carrier would buy an expensive remote server that could do what the PC did without the computer tethered to it. At this point, Nextel was the biggest distributor of the BlackBerry. Nextel used the digital radio technology, which allowed it to work almost anywhere, back when CDMA coverage was below 50%. GSM was still burgeoning, in, at least in the U.S., and so that left analog carriers, Verizon and Sprint, AT&T was a hybrid carrier, that was experimenting with the early versions of GSM, but were not really players in data. Verizon was more conservative and likely would just see what Motorola was offering, as they still had 75% market share, at least in CDMA. Then there was a handful of early GSM companies, uh, all regional with less than 500,000 subscri subscribers. They leveraged the low cost of GSM with much longer range to compete in Midwestern and Southern cities, where tower density was low. Here's an early GSM phone from Ericsson. The cost of installing a tower was so low that technical issues compared to CDMA were basically non-existent. But GSM's focus in those days was on voice market penetration and not data, as they were the low-cost alternative. That left lowly Sprint. Kansas City-based Sprint was the first to the party with a fully digital ground-up network. Their network was built to support data, but it was small and expensive to build and maintain. Still, that best met the newly reformed Palm's business model, so they went with Sprint. Sprint loved the Palm phones. After all, they would not have access to BlackBerry until they acquired the tiny but immensely profitable Nextel a couple years later, and then the roof fell in. Of course, Teleflip was vaporware, but it didn't matter with the BlackBerry being better. And let's not forget, more secure, the trio was on its way out. Now, just down the road, General Magic had mysteriously disappeared. They had never really released a product. Well, well, one product, but it sold for about a week before being pulled from the shelves. Everyone in the industry knew General Magic had a secret sauce, but could not quite perfect it. General Magic was to the mobile industry what the hydrogen fuel cell was to cars. Great idea, proven, but impossible to implement. Now it was 2007, and in June, Apple unveiled the iPhone. Again, the iPhone had promise, but the data was impossibly slow, mainly because it had an exclusive agreement with AT&T, which had impossibly slow data at the time. They also had no scalable data infrastructure, but more on that later. So while you might see Apple as having a two-year head start on Palm for a really excellent smartphone, Palm saw it the other way around. Apple would take two years to release the iPhone 3G, which was the one that everyone bought. That gave Palm enough time to recruit from Apple and General Magic ranks to get the best talent. But by June 2009, that may have been the best time to release a new expensive smartphone. The battery life was terrible, but not any worse than Apple's. With AT&T ramping up data to accommodate the iPhone, Sprint was becoming the poor man's carrier. They gradually kept putting off issuing promised POs, which left the dot-com bubble and the subprime financial crisis beaten palm. Now the company's entire value would not even have covered the WebOS development costs. So even during its release, Sprint was screaming for a low-cost model. WebOS, as it turned out, was a genius low-power operating system. It was so good, in fact, even Steve Jobs publicly acknowledged it is the only real competition to iOS. Plus, WebOS was pretty much open source, and anyone could develop on it. WebOS allowed for true multitasking, which was still five years away for Android. The 3Com parent was also pretty much out of business after the subprime collapse, so Palm was supposed to be carrying the entire company with Sprint as its only customer. The Pre-2 fixed the Pre's problems in the same way the iPhone did for the Apple, but sadly, it all came a little too late. 
Palm did manage to release the immensely popular Pixie for both Sprint and now Verizon, but they were losing money on it. It kept the company going mechanically for a while, but the writing was on the wall. Hewlett Packard had missed the entire computer revolution. They made some reasonably impressive hardware, but they could never sell it. Eventually, with Compaq acquisition, they became the computer company they'd always wanted to be. But from an engineering standpoint, you couldn't help but love WebOS. Plus, they too tried to make Windows CE and Windows Mobile powered appliances that did not sell. BlackBerry had fallen on similar hard times. The iPhone hurt them far more than it hurt Palm. In fact, people were flocking to AT&T to get an iPhone, leaving Verizon holding the bag. So just as US Robotics had promised years earlier, HP bought Palm and spun them off into a reasonably autonomous company. But Palm had Apple-like R&D budget requirements with Sprint sales. The Pre-2 came and went like the wind. Almost everyone at HP was given one, and you can still get one of those today on eBay for almost nothing. Apple bought the iPad with, with almost no warning, less than a year after the Pre came out. So did Palm and BlackBerry. All three of them had pads out. The BlackBerry was first and was terrible. To use it, you had to pay a monthly fee on top of your data carrier, and it cost too much. It was also underpowered and sold through mobile phone channels instead of retail. It failed almost immediately. But the Palm took their time. With the over-engineering help of HP, the Palm tablet was a beast. Great speed and power, copious storage, great screen and battery life, and retail distribution from Best Buy. Even by today's standards, this was a capable tablet. Many are still using it to run Android. But Palm was done, and HP rolled them in and changed the name for the product to the HP Touchpad running WebOS. They also announced the HP Pre-3 and the Veer, all running WebOS, built in a platform designed for Android. Just after just 49 days, HP announced it was no longer going to support WebOS and killed the Palm products. So ahead of their time with these devices that they have been seen running Android 9. The fire sale commenced and it was the end of the line for the pre-based hardware, but not the end of our story. WebOS is based on a Linux kernel. It's being marketed today as Linux Phone. Qualcomm, the inventor of CDMA, now owns WebOS licenses to LG to use on their smart TVs and other smart appliances. As the greed controversy continues at Apple and Google's Android in jeopardy of being broken up, WebOS may be the preferred operating system of the well-heeled smartphone user. Only time will tell. So Palm had one of the most difficult to follow corporate histories of any company I've ever seen. But this is a timeline of what happened at Palm. In 1993, Palm was established to support Zoomer and the Apple Newton. In 95, U.S. Robotics acquired them. Uh, in 97, 3Com acquired them, and Handspring formed in 1998. In 2000, 3Com uh, uh, spun off the Palm division into Palm Incorporated, listed on a NASDAQ. Uh, in less than a year, it lost 90% of its value, uh, going from $95 to $6 a share. In 2002, Palm Incorporated spins off the software division to concentrate on hardware, specifically phones that was called Palm Source. Uh, Palm and Handspring merged in 2003 and create Palm One Incorporated. In 2005, Palm One buys Palm Source and they reform as Palm Incorporated. Uh, in uh, 2005 to 2006, uh, Access, a company, buys the Palm Source assets, and Palm buys a revocable license to use Palm OS. In 2007, after uh, rumors of a sale, uh, Palm sells a 25% stake to fund the completion of WebOS. Palm announces the end of the PDA about a year before releasing WebOS uh, pre as a Sprint-only product. Uh, the second fall happened in 2009. After announcing the uh, completion of WebOS, Palm stocks rise from 3 to 18 but then it falls back to $4 after the pre-release. Palm uh, HP buys Palm for over a billion dollars and invests that again in R&D and rebadges all the products as HP and then dumps WebOS. That was in 2010. In 2013, LG Electronics buys WebOS assets to use its new smart TVs. In 2015, TCL buys assets from LG uh, and licenses, uh, licenses WebOS back to them. Basketball player Stephen Curry and investment team buys the assets of TCL and renames the company Palm again. In 2018, the Ultra Mobile Companion device, a second phone, 
as a distraction limiting device. It's a Verizon exclusive and it is a flop, huge flop. 2018, LG makes WebOS open source. But wait a minute. That would allow anyone who wants to develop on WebOS to legally do so. But Qualcomm still owned WebOS with the patents that they got from HP in 2014. So uncertainty still rules the day and stifles the WebOS development beyond simple IoT devices. <laughs>